Welcome to the International School of Tailoring. My name is Reza and this is going to be your 28th lesson of our How to Make a Bespoke Jacket series. In the previous lesson, we looked at all the factors that you have to understand and know about to construct shoulders. In today's lesson, we are going to first baste and canvas the shoulders, then we're going to mark the armhole, and last but not least, we are going to insert the shoulder pads. Are you ready, my friend? Let's go. Take your jacket. It may be that you have creases in it, so the first thing I would say is make sure you spray this with a pressing cloth and take all the creases out. So, as you've seen, I did not use a pressing cloth. You should. The reason why I don't use it is so that you can see exactly what I'm doing. Now, let's mark our shoulders. What you have to do is the following. Put your jacket on your board so that the back and the fronts are laying flat. Then, flip the fronts over to the back, right side to right side. Then, take both shoulders flip it over so that the entire jacket is away from you and you have access to both the shoulders on the back and the shoulders on the front okay so let's begin with the shoulders on the front take your chalk mark your gorge and your neck curve and of course the starting point of your shoulder neck point take a seam off downwards and do the same here on the armhole run, the shoulder point, and take a seam inwards and downwards, okay? So this point is where your sleeve is going to be sewn and your shoulder. Here we only have the shoulder, nothing else is going to be attached. Our collar, in fact, is just going to be on this line, not a seam in or over, which is why we only marked one seam here and two seams here at the same time. Then what I want you to do is to mark the entire shoulder line as you have mark stitched it. Then I want you to take the point between this seam, this sewing line right here, this cross, and this seam, this inner cross right here, and take the center. Once you've found the center, and you can do this roughly by eye, move a seam in and the reason for moving a seam in here is because we are going to connect the edge of our pattern to this line and go back to the edge of the pattern like so now what we have done is we have hollowed out our seam while keeping the shoulder and the neck point on the same place what are we doing we are creating a surface shape on top of our seam design okay once you've done that i want you to thread your needle with your basting thread take the fabric and run a running stitch with a distance of a quarter of an inch that's six millimeters and a bite size of an eighth of an inch that's three millimeters through this line so in fact this new line is the new edge of our pattern now it's important that you leave a little bit on the neck area and a little bit on the shoulder area. We are going to stretch this shoulder in a second and that's going to take up some of this thread, okay? I'm gonna do exactly the same on this side. Once you've done that, make sure that both of them are exactly the same. I can see that maybe by half a millimeter, this seems a little bit wider than here now based on my experience i know that that's not going to make a big difference so i keep it there but if this was three eighths and this was half an inch so any deviation more or the same as three millimeters i would redo it okay so now that we've done this flip the back shoulder over and do exactly the same as you did on the front so mark your neck curve mark a seam off Mark your shoulder ends, mark a seam off, downwards and inwards, all right? Mark the shoulder line, 
find the middle between the inner sewing line and that of the neck and clear this area out by 3 eighths. Why 3 eighths? Because that is something that the average shoulder will take up in terms of shape. We're going to do an edge to fold transfer in a moment, which is going to help us to create a natural, subtle saddle-like effect on the construction of our shoulder. I'm going to do exactly the same on this side, and then I'm going to baste through. Once you're done, double check. Does it look like what I have in front of me? If so, that's good. Now let's do a quick check and to recap this. If you look at these two shoulders, you will notice that the curve that we have on the back shoulder is a lot more severe than the curve we have on the front shoulder. I have already covered this with you. If you don't understand why this is the case, please refer back to part one of our shoulder theory lesson. So let's continue. We are now going to perform an edge to fold transfer. Please keep in mind, my friend, that we are talking about this line as the edge of the pattern, not the actual edge of the inlay. Some of you may stretch this inlay right on the edge and then notice that the fabric has no more give while this is still in a concave curve. We are going to grab the fabric from where our line is and stretch that area. Ignore this edge right here. Now, the more inlay you have, the more difficult this is but you have to do your best to stretch this until this curved line is at the very least perfectly straight. All right, so do as I do. Put some moisture, take your iron, bring your iron right on the thread, take the other end where the thread is and gently as you move your iron forwards and backwards, pull this line. So that's the first round. Now, as soon as you apply some water on this, it's going to contract. Look at this. Therefore, we are going to repeat this at least three times. So, pull again. Make sure you are doing this from the wrong side of the fabric. You do not want to scorch the right side of your fabric and create a shine. If you have a domestic iron, please be a bit more patient and repeat this process a few times. One of the things that I'm doing, I'm not just pulling. I am pulling and I am turning this into a curve bit by bit. If you are afraid of doing this on the actual jacket, take a piece of calico or muslin or whatever scrap fabric you have and practice exactly this move on that fabric. Maybe even push it until it rips so that you understand the power of your own hands, of your iron, and the limit of the fabric. All right, let's do this one more time. Now, sometimes you see me start here and pull back. The reason why I do that is maybe the fabric has some starch. The starch sticks to the sole of the iron, which then moves along with the iron. Therefore, what I do is I counteract the forces that they have and instead of going along with the iron I go in the opposite direction so that if it sticks it doesn't move along with the iron. Now you can see that this line is pretty straight okay. What I'm going to do is I'm going to just move the iron inwards like so and I'm going to fade this harshness that I've created on the fabric into the surface. The next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to stretch the neck curve by doing pretty much the same. Now here, we are not going to go as extreme as we did here. However, we do need to stretch the inlay and a little bit beyond the inlay. Remember, when this goes around the neck and this is cut to really hug the neck, it has to make a negative surface curve to really sit there nice and tight. Grab from the line along the mark stitches and stretch. How much you should stretch? I would say as much until you get a straight line. But don't go too far into the fabric. We went pretty much about an inch, inch and a half into the fabric beyond our pattern edge. Here you should not be any further in more than half an inch, which is about 1.2, one and a half centimeters, okay? 
So that's that. Now, again, from the inside, just smooth things over. And what you should have is the following. Whenever you fold this over on itself, you should be able to get a concave line along the roll of your fabric. The same goes for here. If you do this, you should hypothetically be able to curve this over with as little tension as possible. So this side I haven't stretched. See what happens. If I try to fold this over, there is tension. I, I really have to pull this edge to really get the mark stitches aligned on the edge. Whereas here, it's already kind of happening. You see? All right? I'm going to do exactly the same on this side now. So once you're done with the back, it's time to move on to the front. To do this, we have to do two things. First, let's flip this over. Second, get the back out of the way. And third, start shaping. Now, here we have a straight line. So how are we going to do any edge to fold transfer? The way we're going to do that is exactly the same, but now this straight line will have to turn into a convex line, or depending on which angle you're looking at it, a concave line. Then we're going to do the same around the neck curve, okay? So do as I do. Stretch, but don't overdo it. Do it carefully. This shoulder angle is pretty much on the bias already, and it will stretch out a lot. And you see, as I do that, it turns into a convex line. You always have to press this a few times to get that tension out of the fabric. At some point, once you've done it five times, six times, especially if you are permanently finishing the shoulders, you will do it as often as needed until it completely gives up and has no more resistance. Again, don't be afraid of moving past your line. You can move in by about an inch, inch and a half beyond your sewing line that we have right here. Okay, like that. So then the next thing to do is the neck curve. Be careful. You do not want to stretch the gorge. You just want to stretch the neck curve. Move in by about half an inch, five eighths over the neck curve, just like you did on the back. And repeat that one or two times or two to three times, depending on what the fabric is that you're working on. The general rule is as much as you have to until it has very little resistance. So you see, it's now not doing much more. Once it stops resisting, then you be gentle as well. So smooth everything over and do exactly the same on this forepart. Now, while you're doing this, I don't want you to think as if you're just mindlessly stretching the fabric. You have gone through the theory. I hope you understand the theory you are performing an edge to fold transfer. When you are doing this, you have to visualize in your mind that this fabric is going to have a saddle-like surface, a negative surface curve. So don't just stretch the inlay, stretch the actual surface that is going to be visible to the eye once the shoulder seams are joined together. Obviously, the more you do this, the more you will understand exactly what to do, how much, when, and where. Something I have to mention about this. Maybe you're going to talk to someone, or even you yourself, are going to think that by stretching the front neck, you are crookening the neck point. This is total nonsense. If you understand the concept of crookening, which I will explain at some later time, you will understand that the position of the neck point is not necessarily changing in relation to the rest of the armhole and the body. What is changing is the shape of the surface. So as soon as you have the correct shape filling up this area, just like our neck will do, you see this is kind of like going over. This goes that way, this goes the other way, that creates a saddle. So this can go up into the neck without having any distortions. This is not crookening. This is changing the surface shape. Do not let anyone make you believe that this is crookening the neck point. Once we've done that with the fabric, obviously we have to do the same with the canvas. You may think, hey, didn't we already put a wedge there and is this not all a bit too much? Yes, we did put a wedge there. However, 
we still require to give a little bit of stretching on the very edge of the canvas and the neck okay so let's get the fabric out of the way like that get the bridle out of the way be very careful not to make any pleats spray the canvas tap it and then very gently bit by bit stretch the very edge so that you release any potential tension that's in there now be careful you don't want to rip open the machining that you have done on the wedge so do it very very carefully if you are thinking hey isn't this pretty much a pagoda shoulder no it's not a pagoda shoulder has a very different pad and the severity of the elevation is also not comparable so that's that we don't need to do this like seven times as you want once is enough the canvas is not very resistant maybe we have to do this a few times on the neck again be very careful fold this over and see if while creating a curve over the shoulder you can see a little bit of the neck moving up if that's the case good for you if that's not the case well you have to then stretch out the area a little bit more now do not exaggerate although that's part of the learning process but if you can fold and roll the shoulder over itself as i'm doing now and bring your hand in and see the neck slightly move upwards then you've done a good job so i'm going to do the same on the other side again test flip this over see if you can actually introduce a neck like structure in here and if the end of the neck is flicking upwards well you're in a good place sometimes it's difficult to press from one side or to see what you're doing so you can also do it from this side if you find that easier sometimes i have seen shoulder constructions whereby this area is reinforced with a straight tape or a straight grain piece of canvas depending on what you're trying to achieve it may or may not be wrong however if you ask me if your aim is to follow the natural contours of the body and achieve a perfect classic fit it is utterly wrong to do that because you won't be able to stretch this area or this area to create this neck like anatomy shape on the surface all right so now that we've done all of this let's go back and base everything so place your jacket flat on your board again move the front panel right side to right side onto the back panels like so flip it over so that you have the back facing you and the jacket away from you and now it's time to baste thread your needle mark your back neck curve which you already have when you marked the shoulder and then mark from your new basting line which is the new edge of your pattern a seam off which you also have done but it may have become a bit distorted do the same on the shoulder end so a seam down this is the edge of the armhole and a seam inwards okay so you now have two crossings one crossing here which is your sewing line and the neck curve the other one is the shoulder line and a seam inwards from the armhole line and that is where the shoulder and the armhole sewing lines meet all right once you've done that flip the canvas of your forepart over flatten the forepart shoulder again do the same thing make sure your thread is laying flat mark a seam off to create that intersection mark a seam off right here parallel to your sewing line right there take a pin and i want you to pin your back shoulder sewing line along with the front shoulder sewing line so those two intersections have to meet perfectly like so and that is going to enable your sleeve run to continuously move from the front over to the back now as for the front of the neck I'm only going through the fabric by the way not through the canvas we're going to do exactly the same but we are already going to start basting so get all of this out of the way match your intersections take your thread and your needle 
Once you have matched those intersections, obviously make a knot, take a bite, back tack three times. That's one back tack, two and three. Make sure your back tack is big, at least a quarter of an inch. So now that you have this fastened, I want you to pull both of these and see where your lines are. That's the basting line that you have right here. Take a pin, pull both ends, hold it with your fingers on the board, pull the center over, match the threads together, and put a pin right here. Take a pin again, do exactly the same, this time pin between your shoulder end and the center pin. So pull, bring over, match, pin. Same thing, one more time, this pin is going to be between the middle of the shoulder and the neck point. By doing this, you are ensuring that whatever difference is between these shoulders, because one may be more on the bias and therefore it may have stretched out more, you are making sure that the difference is spread equally from one point to the other, so that we don't end up with surplus on one end and nothing on the other. So once you've done that, you can start pretty much basting because the rest of your lines are going to be uh, matching. Now, I would recommend to sew along a line that you mark, which is again, a seam of the basting line that you have, which marks the edge of your pattern, like so. Make small bastings. So your bite size, an eighth of an inch, your stitch length, a quarter of an inch. So when you reach the end, move all the way over beyond your armhole mark stitches, like so. Take the starting point, pin that down with your finger, pull your thread. Don't do it without, because what you'll do is you'll just gather the shoulder. You don't want to do that. So hold the end, pull your thread to make sure the thread is really well in place, and then back tack once, two times and three times like that now if we've done everything pretty accurately we can take these pins out flip over our shoulder seam and we should be pretty much a seam off the edge of the pattern on the front shoulder okay so i'm going to do exactly the same on the other side and then i'm going to show you how to canvas this now it may be difficult for you and awkward to do this while laying your shoulder like this because you're going to be fiddly and do all sorts of weird things. I have two recommendations. One is learn to sew with your left hand or your right hand if you're left-handed. If it's too difficult, make sure you position the jacket like so. Fold this over so that you can hold it in the most natural way that you would hold your uh, material and then do exactly the same thing okay so let's do this now that you're done you're going to flip everything over so that you can see the right side of the fabric and the first thing that you're going to do is you're going to thread your needle make a knot take the fabric only and push all the inlay that you have over towards the back then start from the neck point with a distance of an eighth of an inch, that's about three millimeters away from the folded edge, back tack once and baste again with the same stitch length, so quarter of an inch and a bite size of an eighth of an inch, all the way over to the shoulder by basting through all the layers of the fabric, not the canvas. Now it's important that when you're doing this, you're not visibly seeing your stitches, okay, or pulling over things so that your stitches become visible. You have to think, anytime your stitches are really visible, it means that actually what you've done is you have let out the fabric a little bit. So if this was machined, your fabric would not move. So we really want to mimic that when we are basting as well. Otherwise, we may think the garment is okay, but actually it's too small, but we think it's okay because everything has been kind of like pulled over due to loose basting. So. What is important for you to observe is that the mark stitches of the armhole are 
running into one another even if they are at an angle and that the same is happening on the neck curve all right again take the end so where your starting point is pull the thread like that okay and then back tack twice two all right so do the same on the other side it is now time to canvas our shoulders I have not shown you how to canvas the shoulder area of your fabric to that of the canvas we did the rest of the body but obviously we couldn't do that until we have basted or machined the shoulder area now while I'm holding this in my hands you can already see if I kind of like mirror this and flip this over that we have a shoulder shape and a neck shape at the same time this has nothing to do with a pagoda shoulder a pagoda shoulder would also flick up at the end and have a roped sleeve this is just going to give us a very natural elegant classic shoulder line all right so how do we canvas the fabric on the shoulder there is no magic in it it's a very simple process however there is a right and a wrong way what is wrong is for you to hold this in your hands like this unlike anything what a shoulder looks like and then try to clear this in weird ways and try to baste it in a very unnatural way what you have to do first of all make sure that all your inlay fabric inlay is going towards the back and if you kind of like let the fabric go it already because it's kind of like stuck in this area and basted it to the canvas it already has a tendency of going wherever it lays most natural with that shape that the canvas has so what we do is exactly that we'll just lift this up let it go kind of like tap it from underneath like that and then move your hands from the center outwards towards the shoulder and the neck just like that and as you do that roll the shoulder in a shape that it's going to have when it's on the individual so I'm not holding it like this because that's no shoulder looks like that I'm also not holding it like this because no shoulder is like that even though you may think oh this mimics the forwardness of the shoulder none of that is necessary you have already built in the forward shape with the wedge and the stretching so hold it like that if I hold it up roughly what you have to look at is a structure like this so my hand is flat palms up it's not like this it's not like this okay this is very important so I just place my hand there to create a flat top surface a bend on the front and a bend on the back now what you could do is you could for example take your shoulder pad put that on your hand and do the same assessment with the shoulder pad so you would roughly place the shoulder pad where it would be and then have a look however what you shouldn't do is to actually position your fabric on your canvas while allowing the garment to hang why not this is going to pull downwards and that downwards pull is not going to allow this fabric to move freely sideways to find its most natural place therefore I always recommend to start on your board have this resting on your board so that you can really lift up the fabric allow it to fall down then tap it move left and right and then you can do what I'm about to show you okay so keep that in mind let's continue you can do this in two ways either on your hand or on a sleeve board I'm going to do one side on my hand the other side on the sleeve board as long as you understand what I'm doing both of them will be good so put your hands inside the shoulder allow the rest of the jacket to just rest and not to pull then put your other hand underneath your seam lift it up so that it can move freely and just allow it to fall okay like that then tap from underneath against the canvas and as you've done that bring your other hand in the middle tap it on the front as if you're kind of like clapping your hands like this tap it move left and right and if it stops moving take one end put a pin repeat take the other end put a pin 
through all the layers, including the canvas, then hold it up, allow everything to really fall down as I showed you, palm up, flat surface on the top of the shoulder, and see if there are any distortions on the front shoulder. If you don't have any distortions, take another pin, put that in the middle. Now, normally I start basting immediately because I understand exactly what's happening, but for a beginning stage, or if you're not familiar with it, pin at least three points like that, okay? Then hold it with your other hand if you're right-handed, do the opposite if you're left-handed, do the following. Mark your break line basting continuously upwards with the same distance that you have from the break line from the neck point. So this is about half an inch behind the neck curve. Then move just an eighth in front of your seam like that, all the way over, put your finger on the mark stitch so that you roughly measure, as I told you about quick measures, for me, this is about two and a quarters. I know that. Two inches, two and a quarters, two and a half, not more than two and a half, not less than two inches. That's the area that you need to cover and make a mark like that. Continue that mark all the way down. Keep that distance from your mark stitches until you blend that into the basting around your armhole. Okay, so... All right, then hold the jacket like you held it up in the air. Allow the top to be more or less flat. Allow the front to have a bend and then start basting. Back tack with a knot once. Small basting, just like you did here, half an inch distance. As you get close to the neck point, take the pin out. Just move it, tap it, brush, whatever do a back tack right here and then continue keep the same shape on your hands okay now move over in front of the shoulder same distance as you get close to the pins take them out back tack again now what you have to do is put your hand in one more time and really allow this area to curve that's what the jacket is going to do when it's on your body. So allow this curve to be there while you continue basting on that line. And one thing I really have to emphasize is do this with one clean thread. Don't fasten on here, fasten off here, fasten on here and use short threads. Always try to do the entire move with one thread length. It's going to be easier to take it out and it's going to look a lot more professional. So once you've blended in, you should have a complete separation of the armhole by roughly two inches, two and a quarter, two and a half, depending on the size of the jacket. Back tack twice and really make sure you are on this crossing. Sometimes when you're finishing a jacket, there's going to be a lot of pressure here. This is going to come undone. Not so nice. OK, so cut your thread, make a knot again. This thread is not long enough, so cut a longer thread. Now what I want you to do is to do the following. Continue the line on the shoulder. You don't have to really do much, I'm just holding it. No need for a back tack, a knot is enough. And go all the way over your mark stitches, okay? Hold this again and do a baste just about five millimeters or three millimeters over your armhole line. That's the mark stitches on your armhole. The reason why we are doing this is to keep everything in place while we are marking the armhole. We do not want the fabric to be distorted. So we'll just do a brief basting. We're gonna take this out before we get to put the shoulder pads in. Once you're done, you should have a shoulder seam that is curved forwards, a shoulder surface shape that is like a subtle saddle. So when you look at it from the front, it has a gentle curve upwards into the neck while the remainder of the shoulder just keeps on straight, okay? This is very important. We have done a lot of stuff to the shoulder and I've covered all of it in the theory, all right? Now, you should not have any weird, strange surpluses, tensions, tightnesses, pulling 
all along the shoulder right here. It should look very natural as if the canvas and the fabric are doing exactly the same thing. If you are concerned about whether the stretching on the shoulder seam will distort the grain, I would say it depends on how you look at it, okay? If I would completely flatten this area and ignore the actual final shape that it's going to have and I stretch the shoulder seam, sometimes I even stretch the armhole and that obviously is going to have an impact on our grain. So if you look at the grain, it goes straight, it goes straight and then it kind of like curves upwards. Or if you look at here, it kind of like goes straight, it goes straight and then it curves inwards. Obviously, we're looking at it flat. However, whenever you look at this entire grain in space it's not going to look as if it's distorted at all because the shape that it takes up in space is going to change the way your eyes perceive the grain of the fabric okay if you don't understand what i'm telling you then you should think about why for example a hollow seam on the underarm or on the side body can look perfectly straight when it's sewn up that is because all those curves are taken up by volume in space and when you look at it in space it appears to be a straight line however whenever you flatten it it then shows all the curves that it has all right so now that you understand what i've done here i'm going to do exactly the same this time i'm going to do it on the sleeve board grab your sleeve board doesn't matter whether you have the forepart facing you or the back as long as you understand what you're doing what I do is the following. I allow the flat, narrow part of the sleeve board to really fill up the top of the shoulder, okay? Nothing should pull, everything should be free of tension, all right? If you have a twist in your jacket, not good. Lay everything so that all is free of tension. Be careful that you are not having your bridle underneath it. And so this is more or less what you should have, okay? Then, what I want you to do is to just take the fabric, just lift this up from the canvas and allow it to fall down. Examine with your hand, feel over it, tap it as you did. This time you just tap and kind of like with a cupping shape, you wrap this around the edge of the sleeve board, like so, okay? Just very carefully. Once you have done that and the front fabric, is filling up the canvas as it did on my hand, you will start pinning again. Pin number one, neck point. Pin number two, shoulder point. Pin number three, the middle of the shoulder. Now that you have that, you can pretty much start basting depending on what position you have. So I can place this the other way around. I could have started from this position as well. Doesn't really matter. Make sure there is a bend here you can start marking from this side or from the other side, depending on what is more natural. If I have to sew with my left hand, I have to make awkward movements or position this the other way around. I can also start from here and then work my way upward. Since everything is pinned and already positioned, there is no difference where you start, all right? Let's continue marking and start basting. Back tag once, since you have a knot, one back tag is plenty. Allow there to be a bend. I'm just putting my hand behind it so that I can push the needle against it. Otherwise, there is nothing for me to really hit against with the point of my needle. Back tag. Again, make sure your bridle is not in the way. You can hold this in your hand. Take the pin out and base this as it's kind of like upwards in the air. Back tack before you change course. Back tack twice, and that's it. That is your shoulder canvassed. Last baste. That's that. Now, before we move on, press with a pressing cloth your seam. Be careful you don't go too far over it because you don't want to flatten all the stretching you did on the edge. Leave the edge alone. Position this in a curve like that, which will stretch out the fabric and spread it out underneath. Then just move with your iron over the edge. You don't have to use a lot of moisture. 
Now it's time to mark the armhole and to insert our pad. Again, you can do this in two ways. I'm going to do it without the sleeve board and with the sleeve board. Take your jacket and lay it flat like this on your board. Make sure there's nothing underneath it. Lay this shape flat. And then I want you to first mark the mark stitches of your sleeve as they are. You will notice a point. Why did we get this point? Now, if you take the pattern that you have and you actually align the sewing lines, you will not see this point. This point was created as soon as we started to hollow out our shoulder seams. So they were like this, then we hollowed them. Now, when you join them together, they will change the surfaces by bringing the center inwards into this angle. All you have to do is to mark a run and smooth this out by maybe five millimeters, three millimeters, like that, okay? Do not try to create a perfectly smooth run. That's not correct. As I mentioned, this will all be visible and seen in space. When I hold this up like that, it doesn't look like a snake run. When I flatten it, it may look like a snake run. That's irrelevant for us. We understand that this is going to be viewed from the top and from the front, okay? So once you've marked the top, then again, lay the four parts flat like this. And now from the edge of your armhole, connect to the rest of your line. Flip this over like that from the base of the side body, move and mark your line. You have to hit the intersection between the top of the side seam and the actual side seam, okay? So don't mark here, don't mark here. Really go where the side seam and the top of the side seam mark meet. Continue, continue, continue into your line here. That's it, you have marked your armhole. Now, I find this the easy method. I find this the practical method. I don't like to waste energy by picking up a sleeve board, but sometimes if you have a very complicated shoulder, you may have to do that. Now, one more thing. Sometimes, especially if you're working in a workshop, you will get a ticket. That ticket is essentially a paper with all the shoulder measures, length measures, lapel width, all the information that you as a tailor need to know when you are constructing the jacket. The ticket will sometimes say, the shoulder must measure five and a half inches, six inches, 15 centimeters, 16 centimeters, whatever. Personally, I do not check to see what the shoulder width is when I'm constructing the garment. What I prefer to do is to actually follow the mark stitches as they are copied from my pattern, construct the garment, see exactly how much I'm deviating for the mark stitches, for example, to correct the shoulder angle, do the fitting and rely on the fact that whatever changes I make on my pattern will be as close as possible to what the client will need after the fabric and the canvas is manipulated and constructed. The problem of checking the measures is so that sometimes you may on your pattern have a shoulder measure of five inches, but then once you've stretched everything out, it turns into six. Now, if I go back to that five inches, the cutter, especially on places where the cutter and the tailor are not the same people, the cutter may think, oh, my pattern was perfect. And so they don't know that you have made certain alterations after the fabric was manipulated. And then the next tailor comes along and they make the same jacket, but it turns out that the shoulder is a lot wider. So don't make corrections for the cutter. Stick to the pattern. If there is something wrong with the pattern, communicate that with the cutter. And if you're the cutter yourself, well then you know exactly what to do. So take your sleeve board. This time we require the wider top of the sleeve board. Put the sleeve board through the armhole, lay this flat, mark first the actual mark stitches, then try to correct it by the same amount that you did on the other side. In my case, that's about three millimeters, four millimeters. Then move this over from the edge, move in on the back. You can see 
this may not be wide enough so you have to move it over to here on the back exactly the same from here move downwards through this crossing curve and that's it okay you have marked your armhole very simple now sometimes what i was doing especially in the beginning was to mark my armhole and to keep looking at it for hours. I'm telling you, I'm not exaggerating. I would look at the armhole from as many angles as possible to make sure that it had a nice run. So I want you to do the same. I mean, you may not have to do it for hours, but don't just mark and go. Mark and evaluate. Look at what you're doing. Look at it from the top. Look at it from the back. Look at it from the front. Put it on. Look at it from the front, from the top, from the back. So I'm seeing that this is a nicer run than this side and I'm assuming that the reason why this is nicer is because I started to fade into the top of the shoulder a lot earlier so it's as if I have a correction like this so that now looks a lot better what do you have to do now the first thing you have to do is to take this basting out that you did on the very end of the armhole that was the canvassing base again we put that base there so that when we are laying everything flat we have a good read on what actually is happening then i want you to take two arm lengths of thread cut through and thread your needle if you can find it then i want you to double your thread and make a knot at the very end hold the end pull the needle make sure that it's one now this thread may not easily so i always try to go through it with my fingers a few times even though that may not do anything and what i will do is i will start basting about five millimeters away from this edge which has no inlay and i'm just going to do a running stitch i am not going to draw this area in okay just going to do a knot a back tack every once in a while you'll notice that one of the threads becomes longer than the other one so you have to run your fingers through it again and i'm just going to continue with a small short stitch length all the way forwards not drawing in anything and once i reach the inlay of my front side i will move on to that line and continue with a running stitch now this doesn't mean that i'm going to use this base as my armhole run it's still going to be this edge but i prefer to have some sort of a thread there not to keep it from stretching out per se but at least to give it some stability we don't want to draw it in but neither do we want to stretch it out okay and neither do we want to completely fuse this to prevent it from stretching if anything a little bit of stretching in this area is very good continue with a running stitch keep that running stitch small the distance that i have now is about a quarter of an inch use the line that corrected the shoulder angle move over to the back and here you will have to baste through your shoulder inlay however be careful that you're not basting it like this okay you really have to allow this to lay as naturally as possible get your hand in there without disrupting anything and then continue again running stitch do not pull anything do not gather anything also the reason why i have doubled the thread is to make that line a little bit thicker do not use your thick and fluffy marking thread to do this some fabrics will be bruised and it's not going to be good for the fabric just use basting thread on the double once you reach the back pitch which is just above the top of the side seam I want you to do a back tack easy loose simple back tack like that then you're going to go in right in front of your back tack take a big bite at least half an inch then over counterclockwise from the top over your needle and pull away gently to gather a little bit okay that's the beginning of a gather now we're going to gather from here up to here we're going to fade in gather 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 most in this area and then fade out and this base is going to be flat okay so remember how much you pull again right in front of the last stitch big bite at least half an inch over your thread pull carefully remember how much you pulled the previous time 
pull away, gather a little bit more, look at what's happening, and repeat. Every time you do a baste and you take a bite, pull just a little bit more until you have reached the middle. That's between the back pitch and this cut area that has no inlay. So here is where we require most of the gathering. But don't make pleats, please. Hold it well. Don't crumple it up so you can see exactly what you're doing. Pull a little bit, see the waves. So now I'm going to do the last pull and then I'm going to start to do less pulling. So that's the max, okay? This is just to allow some of this surplus to be rolled up to accommodate for the shape around the blades. It's not going to be much, but depending on what fabric you're using, it's going to be pretty effective. So here I'm going to reduce the amounts that I'm drawing in until the last stitch has almost nothing. Now, this is something you have to practice. It's best to practice this on a flat piece of fabric so you know exactly what you've done. So, tiny bit, tiny bit, more, 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 most, and then less, less, less. <laughs> I once went to the barber and I wanted to have a fade. And I told the guy who wasn't really speaking uh, the language that I spoke in the Netherlands, which is Dutch, and I was trying to explain that I want to have a fade. And he just looked at me, he nodded, and then he said, yeah, yeah, understand. Short, 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 long, long, long. <laughs> and so he got me a very good fade. And that's exactly how he explained what he was going to do. And I understood it. Short, 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 long, 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 short, short, short. Okay. And here we have very little pulling. Now, what I'm going to do, just like I did with the front side, I'm going to step over from the edge, distance of a quarter, no more pulling, nothing, and just continue this basting. Back tack here through all the inlays, leave a little bit of thread, and that's it. I'm going to do exactly the same on the other side, then we're going to press, then we're going to insert our pad. When you're done, like I said, no pulling or drawing in in this area, nothing on the top, from the back pitch, <laughs> short, 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 long, 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 short, 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 and then nothing at the bottom, all right? so. Take your sleeve board. It is now time to press whatever you have gathered. So just put the armhole over the sleeve board like that. Give it a little bit of moisture and then gently introduce the iron onto the line. Don't go too far in, just about an inch is plenty. Try to get all these ripples out of the way and compress this. Do the same on the other side. When you are pressing, you should not have any pleats after you are done pressing. If you have any pleats, it means that you have really gone too far. You have drawn in too much. Now, when do you get pleats? That all depends on the fabric that you're working with. I think linen is a good fabric for you to practice with because you'll get to see exactly what the effects are. A little bit of this is fine because a seam over, that's where your sleeve is going to be this all falls into the seam so not really a big deal just make sure you get the upper parts and the lower parts as well to insert our pad we have to make sure that we get rid of all the inlay that we have here why because by the time we put our sleeves in we do not want our sleeves to be distorted by this you know, our sleeves are going to be sewn here. So imagine all of this is poking against the edge or the surface of our sleeve. That's going to distort our sleeve. So we are going to fold the inlay of the canvas, especially in like this along the line and then insert our pad with the edge of the pad along with this thread. So how are we going to do this? You take your sleeve board, you put the wrong side up like that, you fold your canvas over, now you are seeing the running line of your armhole, and you're going to fold the canvas against that line, like that, and you're going to start pressing this area flat. Leave the iron on a little bit, start dry, really allow the horsehair specifically, which is the big troublemaker here, to compress once you've pressed it and it lays flat give it a little bit of moisture and then press again 
This time, just leave it on a little bit until it dries out. Once in a while, give it a blow. You can use your block if you want to absorb the remainder of the moisture. Move over so that you can fold the rest of the canvas on the edge right there. So once you're done, do exactly the same on the other side. Now, something to mention, when you are folding this, do not fold the top edge of your shoulder over. Just allow it to rest. You're going to have some surplus. That's fine. Don't try to flatten that surplus. And that's that. Now, the good thing about this is it allows you to have an accurate reading when your sleeve goes in. So nothing is going to distort your sleeve. You can see whatever you are seeing and rely that that is as close as the pattern is. If your sleeve goes upwards and you think, oh yeah, it's going to be fine, you know, whenever I finish the garment, that is very troublesome. It's bad habits in development. Please steer clear of that. Now, one little trick that I want to show you. When your customer wears the jacket, this area you can feel this, is going to be very sharp. The horse hair is poking through. What you can do is to trim the horse hair back by an eighth of an inch just to make sure that it's not there when the customer is trying it on. The impression that your customer gets from the jacket that they are wearing is not just visual, it is also how it feels. Okay, now because this is a practice jacket, let's say, I'm not going to touch that. But if you ever do get a customer, please do this. I personally do it myself always. But at the moment, I just want to show you exactly how things are without manipulating them with fine details. But this is something you definitely should consider. And what you can do is you can trim from here all the way over, fold this over, trim an eighth in here and an eighth all the way to the very end, okay? Just be careful that you don't end up with no horsehair there. You should always have enough horsehair around the armhole, especially when you're trying to fold the inlay in. Now it's time to insert our shoulder pad. This is what you have to do. Just like we held the shoulders when we were canvassing it, I want you to take your shoulder pads Put them against one another and they should be symmetrical. If you are working from our bundle, the shoulder pad that you have will have two holes. Sometimes some shoulder pads have one hole right in the middle. If you have two holes, the middle part where the shoulder seam should be is probably between the two. If you only have one hole, well then it's pretty much on the top of the pad on the highest point. Now to make things easier, grab a Sharpie and find the middle point, put them against one another, find the middle point and put a dot right in the middle like that. Don't be afraid of the ink, that's not going to be doing anything. You can do this with a pen or a pencil, just a little dot is sufficient. Which one should we use? The longer side of your pad with the longer curve goes to the back. So if I'm holding this up, this is the correct pad for this shoulder and this for the other one. Now, if I would try to do this, I would get a bigger piece on the front than I would have on the back. Take your pad, put your pad in here and fold all of this canvas that is now folding in, fold it over flat again. Do not place your pad like this. Okay, you may think you're really clever and cool, but what you're doing is you're reinforcing this end, which is not going to end up like this when the jacket is finished. So open up this fold, allow the pad to fold into this edge. Okay, hold this up, fold the canvas over, make sure this dot is aligned with your shoulder seam like that. Okay, and your shoulder pad edge must be about an eighth of an inch, that's three millimeters, just a little bit over your armhole run. Okay, you can look at it from the top and that's about right. Bring this a bit further down. So now don't pull your shoulder seam to go towards the dot, you bring the dot towards it. 
So once you've done that, and you can see, okay, the shoulder pad is just a little bit over, take a pin, put the pin right through the shoulder seam into the pad, okay? Careful for your finger. Then what you have to do is to align the rest of the pad with your thread, your armhole thread here right now, your thread mark. And if you've done that, more or less, you should have about half an inch showing in this area of your shoulder pad. Sometimes it's a quarter, sometimes it's three eighths. Anything between a quarter and half an inch is good. No more than half an inch, please. Why do we need this excess over? Well, we are not going to have a wing pad. We are going to have a sleeve head wadding around the armhole. Not having a pad extending over the armhole run is going to make this area weak and the sleeve head wadding can just twist back in place and not actually fill up the sleeves, okay? So that's that. Now, once you've got all of that in place, it may be that this area moved. So allow for some flexibility. Try to bring it as close as you can, align it with the edge, allow the fabric, just like we canvassed, to just naturally lay on top, like so. Don't pull, don't do this while holding it up in the air. That's going to pull and it's going to cause a lot of distortions. But once you've done that, you should be able to fold this over and feel the pad right on the edge there, okay? The idea is for the pad edge to be just a little bit over, just a little bit over the edge, okay? So I can do with a little bit more. This part may be difficult for many of you because the pad will stick to the domat. Moving it around is going to be difficult. So you have to constantly lift the canvas over. Have a look. Lift the canvas over, lift the fabric over, position, reposition. Now, once you've done that a few times, you will notice that everything lays pretty smooth. So this is what you have to do. Find where the pad is, grab a pin, Put a pin through the pad and the fabric, one here, one here, one here in the back, and you're ready to baste. So what are you going to baste? You should be able to feel with your finger, I'm feeling the edges of the pad, where the edge of the pad is, okay? So it happens to be in this area. So if this is the edge of the pad and if this is the edge of the pad, I want to baste in about half an inch. So like that. Where is the back of the pad? That's the edge, half an inch in. That's the edge, half an inch in. And I will do that all the way to the very end. Obviously, we're going to have the area for the sleeve completely free. Same width as we have on the front. And if I connect all the lines, I will notice the triangular shape of the pad on the surface of the jacket. Okay, be careful for this little pin because it's going downwards. The reason why I have put it downwards and not in and out like this is because that's very thick. I don't want to distort anything in that area. Just want it to look and feel untouched. So thread your needle, make a knot, start as far back as you can where the edge of the pad is, which is a little bit further out through your shoulder seam, take a bite, one back tack, go through the shoulder seam all the way to the very end. Now, as the pad gets thicker, it becomes more difficult to go in and out. As you do this, you are creating relative layer length. Don't do that, just go up and down to keep things as they are. Come out here. Then you can do two things. You can go to the back all the way forwards or do as I do, run forwards through the canvas, through the pad, big bites. And if you notice, I'm not trying to base this in a curve. I'm just basing it pretty much flat. The reason why I'm basing it flat is because if I base this in a curve, I create relative layer length. If the shoulders of the person are not that curved and they go flat again, I will have all these lumps. So do it flat. If it bends, you'll end up with a little bit of bunching up underneath the pad, which is exactly the right thing because those cushions will accommodate for the imperfections of the shoulders and the areas that are not filled up by the body will be filled up by the cushions. So just baste it flat, go all around. And when you reach the end towards the back, do a back tack once. Now you can take this pin out, which has probably been poking through your finger many times and baste back up and that my friend, 
is your shoulder pad inserted. Back tack on the top, and that's it. Now, for those of you who are wondering, I went all the way through the pad in this area. I'm really trying to go through the pad as much as I can, even if that means that I have to go up and down. So, that is now our shoulder. So, if you look at this from the front, it's pretty straight, no pagoda, it just curves up elegantly towards the neck, and that's exactly what a classic fit requires. Okay, if you have those silly reinforcements in the canvas to prevent anything from stretching out, you're making a soulless jacket which is not going forwards, upwards, nothing. It's just folding over the body. I don't like that. So I'm going to do the same on the other side and we're done. If you're doing the other shoulder, you may struggle with things. It may not handle the same. You can always put your hand in the other armhole and then hold things. That can also allow you to assess. Remember, what you want is for the fabric to lay. You can also do this, create this hollow effect. So thumb goes towards the neck, the rest of the hand towards the shoulder, just to see whether everything that is the fabric and the canvas are in the right place and are doing the right thing. So at the moment, things have to move. So having the pin here anchors the pad I can then pull the front, it pulls the back over, I can pull the back, it pulls the front over, and position it as good as I can. So the important thing is at least a quarter to three-eighths visible on the back, towards the back pitch, and if you do that, the rest should fall pretty much in place. Remember, these pads are ready-made pads. They are not made for this pattern. So if you're using it for your own jacket or your own pattern, ready-made pads may not always match. Ideally, the entire shape of the pad, just like we are doing on the pagoda shoulders, will match the entire anatomy of the pattern, both on the top of the seam and on the back and around the armhole. But what you want is for all of the fabrics to just lay as naturally and you can really see this shoulder structure. Hey man, play around with this. Grab this in your hands. Don't be you know, afraid of touching it. Touch it, crumple it, cr you know, just play with it until it, it's like a, huh, it's like a piece of clay in your hands and you can shape it to whatever shape you have in mind, okay? That is what your aim should be. That is what mastery means. That is both of our shoulders done. Now what you have to do is check the points, check the ends, see if your pad is too far in compared to where your armhole marking is. See if it's too far out. It should be exactly as I have it. It should just bend right on the edge. And from the back, see if the amount that is visible is roughly the same. Not more than half an inch, anywhere between three eighths, quarter, half an inch, that's fine. Three eighths is probably the best. Half an inch is just pushing it, but not more than that, okay? The compression that you have done here or the gathering should also be the same. And if I place the shoulders now as it would be on my body with the front edges somewhat matching each other. So this is how it would be on me, right? You can see that we have shoulders and neck. It's not flat, okay? This neck is because we have stretched the front neck curve and the back neck curve. And from the back, it looks pretty much the same, okay? You can see it goes into a neck. All right, for the next lesson, man, I've got some stuff to talk about in regards to color. So make sure you're there. And that was shoulders. You see, after all these theory videos, this whole lesson seems pretty simple and straightforward. However, you may struggle. It's not always as simple as it looks. My recommendation would be, if you struggled with anything in this lesson, redo it, practice, undo the shoulders, redo it again, do it a hundred times. It's all there for practice. That being said, if we have brought value to you and you like what we're doing and you'd like to support us, please help us with a small donation. Your donation will help us to create more content at a higher quality. If that's too much asked, at the very least, please subscribe and refer us to at least three of your friends. That again will help us to grow our channel and to create better content with more interesting topics. My name is Reza. 
with Mowgli behind the camera, and we look forward to seeing you in the next lesson. Take care. My name is Reza with Mowgli behind the camera, and we look forward to seeing you soon. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.